So we're going to release something tonight. I believe it's the answer to the mess we're in. Does this make sense? You know, I think really ultimately the answer to the mess we in is, is in the name J-E-S-U-S ultimately. I mean, but there's a plan, there's a pattern in the scripture and that's what I want to look at. Something else John and I were speaking about today, John Ward from Hong Kong he said he recently did a study on the recent, you know, all the great awakenings and revivals in history, not just recent, but in history. And he was looking at the similarities. What was it that opened the door to the, the wind of the Holy Spirit? And, and one was is that, yeah, the second wind word, I received that. But also, but there was, there was a commitment to the word of God. You know, they were committed. Now, there were times when, some of those in the, those revivals, they would preach out of a monotone voice. And, you know, they weren't that flashy. They weren't uh, eloquent in speech. D.L. Moody was horrible. He couldn't even, his English was terrible. But um, he couldn't pronounce certain words. There were times, I never forget the story when he was preaching. It was at Fifth Avenue. It was a church. I don't know, one of the churches in New York City. It was a really highfalutin church. You know, and um, in those days, 
That's when people would smoke cigars on these poles, way before our time, you know, way, way before. But I remember seeing pictures of them, and it uh, looked really interesting. So I guess, I don't know about cigars, but cigarettes. I don't know how you get a cigar in that little, you know what I'm thinking about. That. You can tell I never done it. I just saw the pictures there. I haven't done that, but anyway, it's a high flute church. And anyway, they invited D.L. Moody, and they didn't, you know, they didn't know if they wanted him to come because his reputation of being kind of a radical. But they invited him anyway, and uh, he was preaching out of the book of Daniel, and he couldn't pronounce Daniel. He'd say, Daniel, and he'd use words like ain't and haint, and, um, and the people were laughing, looking around, making funny faces, you know. Who is this guy? Who is this what does he do? And then all of a sudden, they got quiet because the Holy Spirit came in. A divine hush came into the room, and they were no longer listening to the voice of D.L. Moody. All of a sudden, they became conscious of the other voice, the voice of the Holy Spirit. Some of you have heard that story. I've carried that story around with me all my preaching years. I've never forgotten it because it's what I want. I want others to hear the other voice. And uh, because that's the voice that matters. Now look over with me if you would. I just want to touch on some things to follow up on what Gary Beaton spoke on last week. And it was a powerful time. He just shared basically his testimony, which is the name of his ministry. Remember, Transformation Glory. And it is the glory of the Lord that will transform a society. And, uh, but I believe it's the key to to seeing what God wants to do in our nation. I know some people are still holding out, and I hear from them from time to time for a political solution. They believe that someone, I'm not going to mention his name, but all of a sudden he's going to be put back in office and everything is going to change. Now, I don't want to put out their their fire. If they want to believe that, I'm okay with it. You know, I wouldn't, yeah, I'm not going to put that down, but, but that's not the hope. He's not the hope. And just because someone got into office, that just, that's not the answer. There's something far greater. The hope is not in who sits in the White House. It's the one who sits in this house and that house and God's house and wherever you are as a part of the house of God. And um, So anyway, I wanted to follow up, and so this will be some teaching, and, and uh, maybe we can release something here tonight because I'm just going to pray in faith. Is that okay? I'm a David. I believe we can slay Goliath. I know there are big giants in the land. I'm not, I'm not, you know, we're not, we haven't dug our head and put it in a sand. But we've dug our, we put our head in the word of God. And so we know there's hope. And there's an answer. So anyway, just over 2 Kings chapter 22, just remind you, you know, that the reforms of Josiah, they found the book, the word the standard, the law of God. They began to read it out loud and Josiah came under conviction. In verse 13 of chapter 22, 2 Kings, he said, so inquire, go inquire of the Lord for me, for the Lord, for the people and for all Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found for great is the wrath of the Lord that is aroused against us. So that was the answer as to the reason they were in the mess they were in. And it was because of their sin. And so all of a sudden they discover the words of the book, the laws of God. And so Josiah acknowledges, great is the wrath of the Lord that is aroused against us because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written. And then um, over in verse 16, for thus says the Lord, behold, I will bring calamity on this place. And so they've read the book and they see the judgments that come because of sin. How many of you know it's still true? The wages of sin is death. We must proclaim that. There's no alternative. I don't care who comes up with a different plan. The, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God. But you have to receive the gift of God. You have to turn. You have to make a turnaround. And then he goes on and describes Uh, what's going to happen. And then all of a sudden, in chapter 23, Josiah is inspired to begin to make a change and to seek the Lord. 
and he humbles himself, seeks the Lord to turn the nation back to the Lord. And then in verse 3, then the king stood by a pillar, chapter 23, and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and with all his soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book that they found, that, that they discovered. And all the people took a stand for the covenant. And when all the people come into agreement and take a stand for God's word, something's going to happen. Would you not agree? Well, I don't know that if all the people in America, well, obviously that won't happen. But there's a remnant in this hour that are doing just this. They're taking a stand on the word of God, right? And they're taking a stand in whom we're going to trust and where our hope and our help comes from. But then this really ignited Josiah. He starts tearing down, you know, the altars to the false gods. He tore down the ritual booths in verse 7 of the perverted persons. That was sexual immorality. And, and then you can read on and on the corruption. And they started turning back to the Lord. They acknowledged their sin and they began to see a move of God. They began to see a revival Well, that's what we're believing for. And um, so that's what I want to talk about, and then we're going to pray. So, Lord, I just thank you for this word. And, Lord, I, I just ask God for that second wind tonight. I pray that, Lord, as we preach and we declare the word of the Lord over the Internet, Lord, as it goes forth, Lord, you're the one that causes it to never to not return void. It will accomplish your purpose. So let it accomplish what is in your heart. Let it bear. Lord, we're asking for the maximum fruit, not 30, not 60. We have faith to ask you for 100-fold fruit and for a harvest that is identifiable, Lord. We're in a great struggle, but we thank you. We're following the one who already has finished the race and won the victor. He's the victor. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I want you to go to the book of Haggai and um, chapter 2. Haggai chapter 2. And obviously, there are two things that can turn a nation around. One is repentance. When I look around, to be honest, I've not seen any great move of repentance is anybody else have you seen a great move of repentance i mean a sweeping move of repentance across the land maybe you have that i haven't heard of i've seen i've heard of pockets and i know individuals i know that all of us it's been in this season a time of searching you know all of us have been like david where we said lord search me and try me see if there be any wicked way within me you know you know my heart and so there has there been some individual repentance. So there's either going to be repentance or something else must happen that may lead the way to repentance. That's what I think this would, ha- this would do. So here's what I'll, I'll, you'll understand. Look in chapter 2, verse 2. It says, Speak now to, to Zerubbabel, the son of Shatil, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people. Say, Who is left among you? who saw this temple in its former glory. And how do you see it now? In comparison with it, is this not in your eyes as nothing? Now, can you see how this relates to our day? How many of you remember the days of those great awakenings? When there were, you know, we used to see massive crowds in football stadiums, and you know there were you know, I'm just telling you, when I was a little boy, there were people that loved God. I mean, Jesus was your whole life in those days. You didn't have anything else. And then came all kinds of things that entered in. But, but the Lord is going to do something about it. But he's asking them, who is left among you who saw the temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now in comparison with it? Is this not in your eyes? It's nothing. Yet now. Now, here's, his, here's what the Lord tells the people. And this is what we're speaking and releasing over the airwaves, over the land. Because the Lord knows what's coming, and he says, you be strong. Say, be strong. And I tell you, you're going to have to be strong, not in your own strength, but in the strength of the Lord, in the joy of the Lord. You will find your strength. But in America, the church, because God loves America, 
There's a remnant that must hear what God is saying. Be strong, says the Lord, and be strong, Joshua, Zerubbabel, and all the, and the high priests. Be strong, all you people of the land. In other words, God's not leaving by anybody out. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. For I'm with you, says the Lord of hosts, according to the word that I coveted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my Spirit remains among you. Do not fear. Do not fear. So look at, just quickly, look back a few things that he reminds him of. First of all, he says, be strong. You got to be strong. Secondly, continue the work. Stay the course. Somebody gave me a word. Was it this week? I don't remember. Any of you guys lose track of weeks sometimes? <laughs> I don't know. Was it this week, last week? Was it this month? Last month? I don't even know. But it is a good friend of mine. He's another man that encourages me. He may be watching. But he called me up to his house. He summoned me to Lee. He lives up around the parkway and to come and sit on my porch. Well, yeah, you know, he's the kind of guy you just listen to. There's some people you listen to, some you, you don't. But he's one of those you listen to, and so I came. And he said, you don't quit. Now, I wasn't thinking of quitting, but it's not like I've never thought it before. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. You ever just, you know, sometimes you think, God, this is too hard. This is too difficult. Lord, do you know what they're doing? To me. And he reminds you, you know, what did they do to me? What, are you better than me? You know, anyway, it's, you know, that's the story. You guys have been the same way. So, anyway, I'm with you, all the people, and work. Continue the work. I'm with you. Remember, in these coming days, it is going to be absolutely vital that we remember that God is with us. You know what I'm talking about. And it's so what if all are against us. If God is for us, who can be against us? I'm with you. According to the word that I covenanted with you, that's what? The promise of God. So he's reminding them of his promise. When you came out of Egypt. Now, Egypt is a type of sin out of bondage. So there's a relation. Do you not know that from the first day that you called upon me and you stepped out of the sin bondage and you came into the glorious liberty as a child of God, I've been with you from that very day. How many of you could say that's your testimony? Because I remember in college, if I had been God, I would have left me because I left him, you know what I mean? And there were, we, you know, we had to live for a time. God never left me, not one single day. According to the word that I covenanted when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. Now, why did he say do not fear? If the Lord tells you do not fear, why would he do that? Because you may encounter some things that would tempt you to fear, right? Right? You can see the fear on the people's faces today everywhere you go. It's like you can cut it with a knife. And the Lord's telling us, do not fear. Now, here's the reason. Verse 6, he just happens to explain. For thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once more, if it is a little while, I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations. Now, before we read on, this is a global affair. Anytime something is happening globally, we probably should pay attention. You know what I mean? Because in that Sunday, I'm going to talk more about that, but in the book of Revelation, there's a global affair that takes place. You'd be wise to be wise in that hour. And the same thing would be hold, to hold true. Do not fear. And right now, all the nations of the earth, things are happening. And God's shaking them. It's not the devil. It's God. I'm always reminded of that. Because, you know, this is repeated over in Hebrews. The Lord said, I will shake. 
we got to remember who's God here and who is not God. I'm going to remind him all the days. He's not God. Our God is God. And what do you think the desire of the nations is? Well, I think it's a person, the person of Jesus. Really, what Pakistan is looking for, if that, whatever they were in the streets for today, or whenever that was, it had to have been today, but whatever, all the nations of the earth, what they're really looking for is Jesus. He's the desire of the nations. And I remember somebody was standing over here. It was, it was a ministry meeting. There were a lot of pastors here, and they spoke a word. They said, the nations are going to come into this place and find their desire, their heart's desire. Something like that. And I'd, so I'd say, Lord, let it be. So I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations, and I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts is the Lord of the armies of heaven. So that means whatever battles we are facing on earth, the God who is with us is the God who is over all the armies, the greatest armies, the armies of Almighty God, the armies of heaven, the angelic host. And then he reminds us, and I, I don't have the full understanding, but I'm glad of it for verse 8 when God says, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. Personally, I'm glad for that. Anybody else? It sounds like to me that even though the world may go broke, if God owns the silver and God owns the gold and I'm part of his kingdom, I'm not going broke. Somehow, some way, I'm going to find that there's an abundance, there's provision in the house of God because he's my provider. Right? Does that make sense? I said I was going to teach and not preach, so I'm going to have to repent already, but still, it may come out. I can't help it. But this is the promise. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. Saying the Lord of hosts adds a, a little punch to it, doesn't it? To something, it does, a real punch. And in this place, I will give peace. He speaks to the people, says the Lord of hosts. So we're going to walk in peace. So don't fear. Keep working. You know, remember the promises of God. Remember that I put my spirit upon you. Now I know the Holy Spirit came into me when I, as a nine-year-old boy, knelt down and asked Jesus into my heart. But I know that what happened on that day in J.S. Mississippi when I knelt down by the couch in my apartment after listening to the tape from Jack Taylor on how to be filled with the Spirit. I remember, and the Spirit of God came on me. You've heard the testimony. So in other words, you have your own testimony. The Lord's saying, don't forget I put my Spirit upon you. Don't forget. Regardless of what happens, don't fear. Don't forget. Be strong. Continue. Walk in peace. Because I'm going to shake everything that can be shaken. And the purpose is so that even the nations will find what they've really been looking for, which is me, Jesus, right? That makes so much sense to me. Now, God is a God of suddenlies. He's also the God of divine delays. You know what I mean? There are divine delays that are purposeful. And I thank God for the delays in my life. There's some things he would not give me when I ask. Because if he had of, it would not have been what I had really, what God wanted to give me, or really what I needed. Does that make sense? Same thing for you. Give me God. No. When God gives, it's his best. And he's a timely God. He's on time. But he's also a God of suddenlies. And I believe we're living in that suddenly, that once in a lifetime. I've heard that preached. I've heard it prophesied. I'm not swayed by prophecy. I'm swayed by the word. But I am encouraged, and I believe they're going to be suddenlies, right? Yep. Divine suddenlies. And I think we're living in them. i got to repeat this. Those of you that have been around, you heard some of these, you know. You, there's nothing new under the sun. But anyway, I remember this dream. Remember when I, I was in a big field walking through the middle of the field and there were massive numbers of people 
And I knew that when I get to the end, it was a big field. When I got to the end of the field, there was a, a stage set up like we have out here. But I'm telling you, the people were massive. It looked like what I saw in Pakistan on the streets, millions of people gathered. Anyway, I'm walking through this path, and, and I knew that when I got up there, I was going to have to stand on the stage and speak to all the people the word of the Lord. And on my way through that path, now this is the dream. Sometimes my dreams are a lot of fun because I'm just thinking, God, what in the world am I going to say? God, you got to give me something to say. I'm walking down the path. Lord, help. I don't know what to say. They need a word. This is desperate. Look at their faces. This is not good, God. What am I going to say? God, give me something. You ever been there? You know what I mean. Give me something to say. Please, don't let me stand without saying what you want to say. I'm, a, I'm that way all the time, but in this dream, I'm especially. So anyway, I stand up, and I look out over all the people, and I say, this is not the greatest hour in the last decade. It's not the greatest hour in the last 50 years. It's not the greatest day of a generation. I said, this is the greatest day in all of human history. I remember speaking that. And get ready. And, I, and I still, I'm still believing it. I believe God is getting us ready for the greatest hour in history. It's not the greatest time in a decade or 50 years. Generation. The greatest generation is yet to be born. No, they're born. They're on the earth. I believe some of us are part of it. Does that make sense? I'm just saying I know they were called the greatest, and I know why they were called the greatest. My grandfather, my great friend, great grand I know that. And I thank God for them, but we're going to have a great purpose. Okay, so this is how we're going to do this. Go to Ezekiel now 44. I'm just going to touch on a few things and then pray that God would release it. Is that okay? And then we'll pray for people. If anybody's here, you'd like to be baptized tonight. The baptismal is always... You know, we're ready, and um, Jesus has been meeting people in the baptismal tank. So if the Holy Spirit directs you, you can see Shirley in just a moment, and we have all the clothing. But anyway, in Ezekiel 44.4, and he brought me by way of the north gate to the front of the temple. So I looked, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord, and I fell on my face. Now, that to me is like the telltale sign of when the real glory show is going to show up. Because I think a lot of what has been called the glory has probably not actually been the glory. But we need desperately the glory of the Lord to fill the house of the Lord. It is mandatory if we are going to see a nation delivered from destruction. How did you get all that in that? Well, look in the, I'll show you. This is how we'll show. Look, chapter 43. So anyway, they're describing the dimensions of the temple over in chapter 42 of Ezekiel. And uh, verse 20, measured it on all four sides. And then 43, and afterward, he brought me to the gate, the gate that faces toward the east. Let me just read these verses. And behold, the glory of the of the God of Israel came from the way of the east. His voice was like the sound of many waters. Mm. It sounds like, I want to hear that. And the earth shone with his glory. It was like the appearance of the vision which he had seen, like the vision which I saw when, now the word I is actually the word he, when he came to destroy the city. Remember that. He came to destroy the city. Remember, the wages of sin is death. What happens when a nation forgets God? Biblically, anybody remember the scripture? Can I just be honest? This is not a tickle my ear. Scripture, he says he will turn into hell the nations that forget him. That's what it says. Say, well, I don't like that verse. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's what he said. But we're going to show the antidote, the answer. Okay? So he came to destroy the city. Verse 4, and the glory of the Lord came into the temple by way of the gate. Then 5, the Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court. 
and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Now, again, you know, we want to catch up. We're not talking about bricks and mortar. We're talking about this, right? But we're gathered in this brick and mortar. But this is the temple we know that he dwells in us. Anyway, then I heard him speaking to me from the temple while a man stood beside me. And he said, son of man, this is the place of my throne, the place of the soles of my feet, where I will dwell with the children of Israel forever. No more shall there be any defilement and harlotry. Uh, verse 8, when they set their uh, threshold by my threshold and their doorpost by my por- doorpost with the wall between me. And there's so much I don't want to get into all. Now, let them put their harlotry and their carcass of their kings far away from me, and I will dwell in their midst forever. Son of men, describe the temple to the house of Israel, that they may be ashamed of their iniquity, and let them measure the pattern. And if they are ashamed of all that they've done, make known to them the design of the temple and its arrangement, its exits, its entrances, its entire design. Write it down. This is the the law of the temple, the whole area surrounding the mountaintop is most holy. Behold, this is the law of the temple. So anyway, in chapter 44, verse 4, the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord, right? And he fell on his face. They need the glory of the Lord because of the sin. And God is the God who can build up, and God is the God that can destroy. How many of you know that? I mean, he gave an example. He said, if you destroy your temple, you know, he's not going to look at that too lightly. And we see many things. Everything was written beforehand, was written for our example on whom the ends of the ages have come. The people that say you don't need to read those Old Testament verses that point out to us that God is a judge, to me I say that is baloney because God is the same. And we need the Old Testament and the New Testament. And he is a God of justice and he's a God of mercy. And he's a God of truth and righteousness and love. Right? Everybody with me on the same page. But you can't. There's the mercy of God and the justice of God, the goodness of God and the severity of God. That's in the New Testament, in Romans. You know that scripture says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. That's the New Testament. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands. I'm telling you, America, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. But it'd be better to fall in his hands than in the hands of wicked and evil men. Because God is merciful. And God works things for good and purpose. Men don't. Men do the will of their father, the devil. And if you let them continue to do the will of their father, the devil, you will reap exactly what their father, the devil, desires. And what does he desire? Three things. Steal, kill, and destroy. That's it. But there's hope, so stay with me. Okay, so let's look at this. Here's the journey back, or the journey to 44-4. And you, you don't, you know, 44-4-44 means so much to me personally. Bob Jones saw 44 all the time. Shirley and I see 44. I've been seeing it a whole lot more lately, Shirley, too. 44, I just... I look up, it's, it's not now, it's 823. But it, a lot of times I'll look, it's 244, 344, 444. Six, I'm just telling you because God wants us to know that Ezekiel 44.4 is the answer. The glory of the Lord filling the house of the Lord. So anyway, let's uh, just look at some of the things that happen on their journey to where they experience the glory of God. And the first one was after this. And what happened after, in verse 43, verse 1, if you read back before, he began to separate. There was a separation between the holy. Look in verse 20, 20 of uh, chapter 42. He says, to separate the holy areas from the common. There was a separation. Now, in this hour, there has been a separation going on. Separation of the wheat and the tares, right? The sheep and the goat. The wicked from the righteous, the right from the left, doesn't mean that politically, but it could. It might. I don't know. But I know he's dividing. 
And remember that scripture Jesus said, you think I came to bring peace? I came to bring a sword to divide. You know, those that are going to follow me from those who are not going to follow me, they will forsake me. Jesus said, you're either for me or what? You're against me. So they're going to be sheep nations and they're going to be goat nations. I personally believe there's still hope for America to be a sheep nation. That's why he has a remnant that's bombarding heaven and pushing back the gates of hell. There's a scripture, Revelation 21, 24, referring to the glory of the new Jerusalem and how there will be no need for the sun or the moon to shine upon it for the glory of God illuminated it. The nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. Nations are going to be saved and some are going to be turned into hell. That's why we have to have the glory of the Lord fill the house of the Lord. It's the only hope for America in this hour. And we'll, I don't want to get ahead, but anyway, that's the first one. And then secondly, chapter 43, verse 1, he brought me to the place or into a position to encounter the glory. He brought me, verse 1, to the gate, the gate that faces toward the east, and behold, the glory of the, the, glory of the God of Israel. And so God right now is getting us into the place so that we can be positioned to be ready for what God wants to do in this coming hour. Right? How many of you feel divinely called to this place, to Moravian Falls? And so find our place, get in place, and don't leave your post. Because all of hell will try to get you to leave your post prematurely. There's always an attempt to abort the purposes of God. For regions, for ministries, for individuals, don't give in to the abortion. I tell you, it's getting more and more wicked. What did I just read? They're approving now. They can send the abortion pill through the mail. Did anybody else see that or was I dreaming that? No, I read it. Lord, we put a restraining order on that. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that that attempt... To make abortion so simple as to mail the pill through the mail. Lord, we ask God that those plans be uprooted, spoiled, overturned in the name of Jesus. We pray, Lord, that every effort to bring that to pass would fall on its face and all of those promoting it would fall on their face. Lord, we ask you to rise up, spoil the plans of the enemy. In the name of Jesus, we pray that that would be pushed back and not allowed to enter in to tempt our children further. Lord, we pray for your mercy and grace and your keeping power. We put a restraint on evil. In Jesus' name, amen. So he gets us into the right place. I was gonna read, but we'll do that for a later time because I wanna go through quickly and then pray. Because you guys are listening so well. I didn't even know I would have a word to say. It was, I was just hoping. I'm just telling you, I live by faith too. I'm not confident in myself. I'm not. I'm confident in him. And when he puts his hand on me, it's all that matters. It's all that matters for you, right? This is about him in this hour. Jesus is going to get great glory. That's what all this is about anyway. But anyway, remember Moses. He turned to see the burning bush. God got Moses' attention And then Moses turned to see, and when Moses turned to see, then God really recognized Moses. Something happened. It's one thing for God to get our attention, but it's entirely different when we get God's. And when Moses turned to seek the Lord, God paid attention. You can read all of that over in Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. But God, I think right now, he's calling us to turn to him And we're going to find when we make those steps toward him, the the attention of heaven is going to be upon us. And God's going to give us all that we need to accomplish everything he's called us to do. And then the next thing is in verse 2, the the glory of the God of Israel. I just think that he's emphasizing that he has a people that he's chosen. And you know who his chosen people are right now? I'm a chosen generation, a royal nation, a holy priesthood. Say, I'm a chosen generation. He's chosen us. And I know there's a greater all kinds of context to that. But I know in this hour, God has chosen us for his purposes. He's chosen us for himself. 
where his glory would dwell. He's chosen his house. He's chosen his people. We're a selected people. And our part is just to say yes. And then the next thing in verse 2, he not only comes to a people of his choosing, but he comes in the way of his own choosing. That's, look in verse 2, and behold, the glory of the Lord, the God of Israel, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east. In other words, God is going to come his way in this hour, and it might or might not be the way we think he's coming. In fact, we better get out of the way because God's ways are higher than our ways. They're not even our ways. His thoughts are much higher. We can't even imagine what God wants to do. So why are we trying to figure it out? Now, I have to battle that all the time, too. I'm always asking, how many of you ask God questions? That's not a bad thing. But ultimately, you trust in the Lord with all your heart. You lean not in your own understanding. In all your ways, you acknowledge him. And he will direct your paths, right? It's, it's really pretty simple. But the ways of the Lord. God, we need your way. You, his ways can't be bottled, copied, repeated, fully explained. They're past finding out. And then the next thing, his voice yes. and the earth. No, wait. His voice was like the sound of many waters. Man, I don't know about you, but I can hear that going on right now. Maybe not right now, but I'm in this season and time. God is speaking loud and clear. Now, you know, when the trumpet moved into the White House, we were excited. We thought that was the answer. And, and I thank God for all the things that happened. But now there's no trumpet there in the White House. It's not a trumpet. It's barely a flute. It's a broken flute. So guess who's got to be the trumpet? Us. Set the trumpet to the mouth. God's speaking to the people in this hour. Let's trumpet the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. Man, this is the hour. This is it. This is what I ask in seminary. I said, when are, they gonna, when, when are we going to see those guys rise up and say, thus saith the Lord? This is it. And you're the ones he's chosen. Amen? His voice. When he comes and when he speaks, it will be unmistakable and you will not be able to impeach his voice. i never forget that time in Asheville, they invited me to preach at Steve, Steve's church. I don't even think he's a pastor there now, but he was then. But anyway, they invited me, and I'm preaching, you know, up a storm. Because literally, there's a storm outside. And I said something, I said something like, and the God is the God that thunders. And right at that moment, it thundered in that room and shook the whole room. And I almost got under the... I wanted to hit the deck. To be, I'm just telling you, I wanted to hit the deck. And when the glory of the Lord comes in this, like we really know he's coming, I don't know we're going to be at a stand. Who's going to be standing when God stands up in the midst? We need God to stand up in America. And, and I'll tell you, there's going to be a lot of bowing when he stands. It's the great need of the hour. And then when his glory comes back, or the, the journey to when his glory filled the house, the whole earth will feel the impact, and that is, and the earth shone with his glory. The word shone means luminous. In the King James, it's the break of day, glorious, kindle, light, set on fire. It also means, in the Hebrew, to establish favorable circumstance to bring peace and relief from trouble. Sound like to me, every nation on the earth needs the glory of the Lord to visit their land. And uh, that's the answer. This is not a small thing. And it's not a small thing. You read Habakkuk chapter 2. We often mention this. How I'm always amazed at how you read the context of the book of Habakkuk, some serious things going on. Serious things. And then all of a sudden, chapter 2, verse 14, says, And the whole earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the water covers the sea. In other words, the answer to all the chaos is the glory of God. 
in the midst. And then when his glory returns, his people will be filled with glory, and that's in verse 4 and verse 5. And uh, you know that there's great hope. Our hope is in him, our expectation. Did he not say it's Christ in you which is the hope of glory? It's, he is in us. Say Christ in me is the hope of glory. And then when his glory returns, his throne, this is verse 6 and verse 7, his throne, his reign will become known. He's not only come to bring reign in this hour. He's come to reign in this hour. Does that make sense? He's come to reign. And we will not cease until we see his reign. That's what we're supposed to be doing. That's what we do until he puts all enemies under our feet. And he shall reign forevermore. There's going to come a day. All of those that are mocking him now. And the man that stood up in Congress and said we don't need God in Congress. There's going to be a day that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. My prayer is you do it before that day. This is the hour of grace. God loves you. But he hates sin. And the wages of sin is still death. But he's coming to reign as king. And his kingdom is increasing. And we'll talk more about that at a later date. Okay, verse 7, when his glory returns, his presence will be made known among the people. In other words, he's not coming for a visit. He's coming to dwell. Some, who was it that said he's not coming to take Rick? Well, we've heard it anyway from some others. But he said he's not coming to take sides. He's coming to take over. And then his glory, when he returns, or his glory returns in fullness as we read, there will be holiness in the house. The glory will lead his people onto the highway of holiness. That's verse 7 through verse 9. And holiness is not a suggestion. It is a command. Only Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And then verse 10 and verse 11, when we see his people live according to his design, when the glory of the Lord comes, I've had some young guys, and I was probably this way too, you know, we're going to go, we're going to build the church, man. We're going to build, I'm going to build me a big church. Baloney, try it. You're not going to build it anyway. He said, I will build my, it ain't even yours. My, I will build my church. That's the church the gates of hell won't prevail against. The gates of hell may just come in and slap you silly if it's yours. But if it's his, nothing will prevail. You know what I mean? But anyway, the design, the pattern, that's what, you know... It's all going to be ironed out when the glory of God flows in. You won't have to try to fix anything. It's like Rick told us last week. Somebody came to him what, with the cut, three pages of things that were wrong down in Fort Mill. He said he properly took it and tossed it. We can't fix it anyway. We've tried to fix all these things. That's what wore many people out. Why a lot of pastors burned out. They tried to fix everything that was wrong. Why don't you let God fix it? One way he fixes things is by sending the fire and burning it up. That might not be a bad thing. You either burn it up or you burn your own fire. You're burning. We need the burning ones anyway. Anyway, I'm getting way more than I ever thought I was going tonight. <laughs> when his glory returns in verse 19, he will become the focus. It's about him. Now, how did I find that? Look in verse 19. You shall give a young bull offering you are the seed of Zadok who approach me to there it is to minister to me said the Lord and then the next thing this is the last thing this is what will lead to chapter 44 verse 4 and this is the answer because if we go back to verse 3 of chapter 43 it was like the appearance of the vision which I saw like the vision which I saw when he came to destroy the city. 
So where are we wrapping this up at? How do we wrap it up? The only ways I know for a nation to be saved from its current course of destruction, number one is repentance. Of course, we know intercession. can, But another way is when the glory of the Lord fills the house of the Lord. You see it. You see the connection. So in other words, the problem, America's greatest problem may not be out there. The greatest problem may be in here. I mean the church. And when the glory of the Lord fills the house and man moves out and God moves in, then that that out there might come into divine order. That's all I'm just saying. Because I don't know any way to fix it. What are we going to vote? Folks, voting's over. It's rigged. It ain't going to work. You can vote all you want. I'm going to vote. Because my conscience, but it's already been proven. I know they will turn you off if you admit that. It's obvious to everybody, even the people that deny it. The hope is not in any politician, though we're going to vote for the right ones the best we can, the best we can. The hope is in the glory of the Lord filling the house of the Lord. So this is what I want to pray tonight I just want to ask God to do that he put this in my heart and he set a fire in me and I just want to pray and you join with me let's stand you want to come up and play well you're really anointed I can't wait for Sunday you guys are really anointed and you need to keep coming back and and coming back again as well I'm so grateful for all of our worshipers it's been amazing just amazing to touch the heart of God. And um, we've been doing that a lot, I really feel. But I don't know how to pray this, but you, are you guys in agreement with me? Yes. We want to pray somehow. Maybe we should probably repent first for the degree of glory that, you know, this, he said, is this not, is this not what, you remember what it was, the glory of the Lord? And, but did he not promise the glory of the latter house would be greater than the former? So there's an answer. There's hope. So let's just uh, pray. So Lord, we thank you for this night. I thank you for everyone that came to just join with me. We're in agreement in this place that our nation is headed toward destruction. It is the way of all nations throughout history that have forsaken God. There's nothing new under the sun, but we know the answer. Ultimately, we know the answer is in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is in his death and in his resurrection. It is in the gospel. God so loves the world. And we thank you, you've entrusted that message to us and we're going to shout it but Lord we also see that there's a great lack today and the lack is in the house of God it's among the people of God and Lord I just want to repent and I want to ask you to forgive me and forgive us and forgive your church in America Lord to the degree we have lacked your glory it's probably to the degree that we find ourselves in great peril. And we ask God for your mercy and forgiveness. Forgive us, God. We've had the greatest programs, greatest plans, great personalities. God, forgive us for worshiping personalities. And when they failed us, then we were discouraged. God, forgive us. Have mercy. Cleanse us. Forgive us, Lord. God, Lord, we're serious. We don't know how much time we have. And so we're asking for your forgiveness and your mercy. And God, we're asking for the answer, and that is the glory of the Lord filling the house of the Lord to the degree where we will fall on our face. We're asking God from the north to the south. Lord, it'd be great to begin in Minnesota where there are riots that have begun again. 
And Lord, we ask you, which some of those have been here in recent months, that are intercessors in that place, in that city. And God, we just lift them up. We pray, Lord, hear their cries, hear their intercession. We join with them and we pray, God, spare the city. Lord, pour out your spirit, pour out your glory. Lord, we pray for help. The enemy is routing the city. But Lord, did you not say the only ones with the gates of hell will not prevail would be that which you're building. So Lord, we ask you to forgive us for what we built on our own without seeking the advice and the counsel of heaven. Forgive us, Lord, for the Ishmaels where we ran with an idea, but it wasn't the idea birthed of God. And it was good, but it was not the best. And we ask you to forgive us, Lord, for our good works. And we pray for God's works, the greater works. Lord, I don't know any other way. I don't know any other way. Lord, we don't have any other answer. When the glory of the Lord came in, Lord, the whole land was changed. There was a difference, a marked difference. So we're asking you as people in this house that the glory of the Lord would fill the house of the Lord. Uh, this house, our houses. But while we're at it, Lord, this land, this region, Lord, Moravian Falls, Lord, we've been battling and standing on something we know is greater and they couldn't talk us out of it and they couldn't run us from it. And now, God, you got to show yourself as God. You don't have to, but that's our prayer and that's our trust because you are God. Work a work among us, which if you had told us in advance, we couldn't even have believed it. Because what you do is far beyond what we could ever ask or think anyway. For the glory of God that works in us. So Lord, I pray for every person that you'll encourage them. Father, I bind up every spirit of fear. Those that are watching by web stream, I break and I bind and I command now every fear to leave. We will not be ruled by fear. For perfect love cast out all fear. God's not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. So we will not fear. We will continue what you put in our hands. And we will stay the course. And Lord, we thank you. And I ask you to encourage everyone now. Fill them with great hope. Lord, I ask for divine strategy and designs as how they are to prepare and build their own homes and families, things on their land, their properties. God, I pray for divine instruction, divine instruction, visions and dreams. Lord, I ask you for answers of which we do not know, even yet some of the questions. We look to you as our hope, our only hope. God, we pray for those that lead us in this hour. Our hearts are grieved because we see, but God, are they not yet just doing what they only know to do? God, would you have mercy and would you convict them? God, would you save even the, the most hardened leftist antichrist? God, we ask for a move of God would bring conviction, Lord, in the halls of Congress, in the Senate, in the governor's mansions. Lord, we pray, move in the mayor's offices across America. Lord, you said you would pour out your spirit on all flesh. There's a lot of flesh in the mayor's offices. God, we ask you to pour out your spirit in the name of Jesus. God, we intercede for our sisters, our brothers, our sons, our daughters, Lord, many that have been caught up in the deceptions of this hour. 
Lord, and everything we tell them, they, we, we don't have any way to convince them. Lord, we ask you to convince them and show them the way, Lord, because you're all the way. Your son is the way and the truth and the life. And we pray for the revelation of Jesus to break out again across America. And we thank you, God. We feel like we're a part of it right now at this very moment. We're not judging by what our eyes see. We're believing by what God said and the covenant and the promises. And when you put your spirit upon us, thank you, God. Thank you There's coming a second wind. And I prophesy that over everyone in this room. In the name of Jesus, fresh wind of the Holy Spirit. And I thank you, God. Lord, thank you for this night. Lord, mighty God, thank you for your presence. How many of you know he's in this house? He's here. He's with us. He is with us. He's with you, Scott. He's with you, David. He's with you, Megan. He's with you. He's with every one of you.